Right. So right into it, uh, we're going to go stay with Spain. And now Thomas is going to bring us into how Spain, Andalusia, Iberia, whatever name you want to give it, how did it become Islamic? We've seen how it became anti-Trinitarian. And we see how that influence was coming both from the Visigoths coming from the north and then, of course, the Berbers and the Abadis who are influenced, who influenced the Berbers from the south. And then, of course, we're joined by the Umayyads. What about the Islamization of Spain or Andalusia? Over to you, Thomas. Help us out with this. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've got another presentation prepared, of course. Now we're looking at part two of my um, of my presentation on Spain, called this one Al Andalus, because now we're looking at how Hispania basically turned into Al Andalus. And again, I want to start by taking a step back very quick. So, if you remember, we talked about why Muawiyah chose Damascus as capital for his um, caliphate, because it was one of the most important Christian pilgrimage sites of that time. And for the Arab, for an Arab ruler, it was always important to be a protector of a sanctuary. And we've seen the coin, if you remember, on the, in, um, in that episode, where you can see um, the, the ruler being the protector of um, the head of John the Baptist. And then after Muawiyah, well, we know, then first came a couple, uh, came Al Abd al Malik. Then came Al Walid, but then once Al Walid died, his brother became the next caliph, and that was Al Hisham. He became caliph in 724, and he did something strange because he moved his capital from Damascus to Resafa, and Resafa that's quite a bit further to the east. It's near modern-day Raqqa. Yeah, and he com completely rebuilt Resafa in a Persian style. So before him, it was. It was really um, de destroyed in a way, uh, not completely destroyed, but it was really in bad shape. Um, but he, re he moved out there, out of the glorious Damascus, where Al Walid built the Umayyad Mosque and where the Umayyads have set up their caliphate, their, their capital. So he, he moved out of there into this backwater place, into Resafa. And it's, it has always been a mystery to, uh, to historians, even back in the day. So, for instance, we have even Abd al Hakam. He lived from 803 to 871, and he was an early historian. And he speculated that um, Al Hisham he wanted to flee the mosquitoes and swamps of the Eu Euphrates River because that's where he was before. But it, I mean, first of all, that's not a good um, reason. And secondly, he could have gone to Damascus as well, and he would have been way, way, way outside the, Damas the Euphrates River. Um, but when we look at the, the history of Resafa, we might get an idea, because Resafa was previously known as Sergiopolis. It was named after Saint Sergius, who was a Christian Arab martyr, and he, he was buried in Resafa. So once again, we're looking at a place with a very prominent Christian pilgrimage site, particularly among Arabs. So what other scholars have um, proposed then is that that's why he moved to Resafa, because he chose to be the protector of a different sanctuary, not the head of John of Damascus, but the grave of St. Sergius. And Al Hisham, he also got involved in the politics of the Church of Antioch and installed his friend Stephanos, a simple monk, as the Metropolitan Bishop. Again, showing us that um, he was clearly involved with Christianity. Now, his son actually died before him. So his successor would have been Abd al Rahman. And he grew up in a Christian monastery which again would, would be quite a strange place to have your um, have the grandson of the caliph grow up um, if he was a Muslim. And But after Abd al-Rahman's father died, he joined his grandfather al-Hisham in Resafa. So Abd al-Rahman I, he was born in 731. So that was shortly before, obviously, the Abbasid takeover. Now, when Abbas, the Abbasids disposed of the Umayyads, Abd al-Rahman I, he was 
one of the very few ones who could flee and who could uh, make it out alive. His mother was actually from a Berber tribe. So that's where he went to first. And we have very colorful stories about his escape. And um, who knows <laughs> if any of it is true. Um, but apparently he did make it into Northern Africa and to these Berbers from, uh, from where his mother came, originally came from. Then from Northern Africa, he sets over into Spain, which was already ruled by the Umayyads, um, as you remember, the, from 711 to 718 was this, this conquest. Um, but there was also a sort of a civil war going on in, among the Umayyads, among the Arabs. There were two factions who were fighting for, for the rule in Spain at that time. And what Abd al-Rahman I managed to do is to um, engender a lot of loyalty among them. He had the Umayyad name, and he basically, without much of a force, so he had a small Berber force with him when he, when he crossed into Spain, but immediately um, the, the Arabs followed him and he basically went in and stopped this civil war by just taking over outright and becoming the emir of um, al-andalus now as somebody who grew up among this persian architecture in in resafa which his grandfather built um, he wanted to bring that style with him and that's what really this moorish art is in spain it's really persian and it comes from um, Abdur Rahman's upbringing, he, he brought the, the artisans into Spain. He built the Mesquita in Cordoba, which of course is not oriented towards Mecca, because it was a church in the fashion of his home in Resafa, not a mosque. Now in 782, Elipandus becomes archbishop in Toledo, and typically the bishop of Toledo has to be a Catholic, but this Elipandus um, he was an anti-Trinitarian. So we can see a, a sort of um, a power struggle going on there um, between anti-Trinitarians and Trinitarians. And this Elipandus, he tries to unite the church under an adoptionist Christology, so an anti-Trinitarian Christology. He's ultimately unsuccessful. The clergy remains Catholic but this shows us um, that there's definitely now a power struggle going on within the church, not, not with a different religion, but with a different sort of um, a heretical flavor of Christianity. And it shows us how prevalent this adoptionist Christology has become by 782. Right, now we are gonna do another jump you know, to 839. So now we're well in the ninth century. And at that time, Abd al-Rahman II was in power and he convoked a Christian synod because of religious splintering that was going on in, in Spain. Now, this synod, we still have that, the documents from it that were produced. And the main issue was a heretical group called the Casians. Now, actually, we don't know what exactly the Casians believed or who they were. Some, some think, or many think, they were some kind of Gnostic sect. Maybe they just rejected the authority of the church. So, so we don't really know. They were so unimportant, these people, that we know nothing really about them outside of this. Which is interesting for a synod in 839, if the most important thing that they talk about is this um, small splinter group, potentially Gnostic, which nobody has um, really heard of um, since, and not a new religion that's taking over the country. Right? So if, if Islam was take, uh, has taken over um, Spain, that should have been on everybody's mind. They should have, that should have been the main topic for, for all the Christians in there. But it's not. It's some un, unimportant sect somewhere. Um, and now maybe some people think, well, they, couldn't, they wouldn't dare to speak up to the new Islamic rulers. Actually, in a minute, we'll see that that's not the case either. Um, but first, let's look at the year 840. So that's one year later. And then we here we have a letter from Alba, the Bishop of Cordoba. And he decried 
to other members of the clergy that the people of Cordoba believed that Jesus was only a man and not the son of God. So that they were, were anti-Trinitarians and they had an adoptionist Christology. And he said that they used the gospel of Matthew to justify their beliefs. Again, this tells us that we are looking at Christians in Spain and not at Muslims. If they were Muslims, they would have used the Quran. Um, they wouldn't use the gospel of Matthew. So that clearly um, heretical Christians we're looking at here who are, who are in, in Cordoba and who are apparently growing in number. Now, Before things, we move on, the, I mean, yeah. what you're, what you're in, I mean, obviously what you're saying here is that this is in every case, what we're seeing, this stands against the standard Islamic narrative by this time, well into the ninth century, This was yeah. all Islamic. We have, I've never heard anybody say this was not Islamic until what you're saying right here. So you're saying even as late as the mid ninth century, there in Spain, there is a bishop who's writing a letter against the anti-Trinitarians. Yes. It would make no sense. Exactly. So And it would make no sense if Islam was the dominant religion at this time, which would be anti-Trinitarian. Yeah. Exactly. So we've, we've no evidence until up until this time of a new religion of the name of the prophet Muhammad. We have no evidence of the Quran in Spain. We do have, like we do have other letters where they, where bishops complain that the youth, the youth nowadays, they're no longer learning Latin, but instead Arabic, um, which they didn't like, but there's really no, nothing that's point, pointing towards this religion called Islam. Right? Absolutely nothing. Instead, it's all about, heretical Christians who use yeah, the Gospel of Matthew, who are anti-Trinitarians, um, not, nothing, nothing about a new religion. Yeah. Fascinating, that what last point, the fact that they're using the Gospel of Matthew to support their cause, anti-Trinitarian cause, there's yeah. no Quran at this time either then. Uh, at least not in Spain from the looks of it, uh, or if it was there, it would have been used as electionary and not as scripture, right? So they would have... Um, I mean, they, they can only, they would justify their beliefs with scripture. And since they're justifying it with Matthew, that's their scripture and not the Quran. So yep. maybe they've had the Quran, they don't have evidence, but if they had one, it wasn't scripture yet in Spain at least. So I think we know, we know in the East by this time, the Quran had become scripture, but in Spain, um, yeah, it, it took a bit longer. But as we will see in a minute, when it happens, it happens very quickly. Because this all changes 10 years later. And that's where we're going to go now. So around 850, we actually get our first attestations of a new religion. And this happens after the bishop, um, Eulogius, he travels to the east. And he brings with him a polemic against Muhammad. And that's the first time that we get this name in Spain. So from his travels to the Orient, he apparently met other Christians there and he, and he brings with him a polemic against Muhammad. And immediately this Bishop Eulogius and, uh, and Alvar, who we've heard about before, who um, complained about the anti-Trinitarian Christians, they position themselves strongly against this, for, for them now new religion. So they write scathing condemnations against Muhammad, denouncing him as the Antichrist. So as, as I said, so they definitely weren't afraid to stand up um, to this religion, because once they were aware of it, they they were actually more scathing than than um, the polemics that we know from the from the east. And what we can see now is that this this tipping over point that we've talked about when we looked at at, at the, the caliphate in the east, so in Syria and Iraq and Iran. Where, where it really happens slowly. In Spain, it happens very quickly. Because now Abd al-Rahman II, who 11 years before convoked this Christian synod, he's heavily pushing this new religion, if you will. And, he, and what we see is that um, persecutions of Trinitarian Christians started um, around this time, around 850. And what we see is that... Um, What we see is also that among the, let's say, the general population, from the evidence that we have, it seems like they were already mainly anti-Trinitarian. And they actually condemned 
these these martyrs, these these Trinitarian Christians who got killed, and they didn't condemn the persecutors. So it looks like yeah. So the the sort of all the conditions were right for this tipping over into this new religion, right? So um, we've had now a lot, lots of anti-Trinitarian Christians, and they were they've they've already studied um, the Arabic language as, as I've just mentioned. And now this this Muhammad religion comes in, right? And now, um, yeah, it basically tips over very very quickly in Spain. Um, I mean, obviously there are always um, there's always an opposition movement. So in Spain, again, until the 10th century, we see a strong um, Trinitarian opposition movement. But um, basically, by 850, this this is uh, around 850. This tips over, and it it's it's then over for Christianity, if you will. Um, and it's really over then under the Almohadid dynasty, which is then, but only in the 12th century, because they then impose a very strict Sunni Islam. Um, but yeah, that's that's the that's the primary evidence that we have from Spain, and it's. Again, it goes completely against this traditional standard Islamic narrative, and it supports what we've seen when we looked at the history in the East, how, how um, this anti-Trinitarian form of Christianity evolved into Islam. Yeah. Well, okay. okay. So this is the second one that we've done on the Islamization of Spain. And we see this is going taking much longer than everything that we have been told by the standard Islamic narrative. Um, you can see why this will be new for many of you. Uh, you're coming across this for the first time. I'm coming across this for the first time. Uh, I haven't heard really this this pattern that has been uh, that you're introducing here. Ibn Hisham in 724 to 743, uh, 743. Sorry, uh, coming and setting up shop from Damascus down to Rasafa, and that is near Raqqa, which became very, very famous during the, the whole problems that we had in 2014, 2015 with ISIS, their headquarters for ISIS. Um, he probably, as you're saying, probably chose it because it was the, it was the martyrdom of St. Sergius, and it was called Sergiopolis uh, during that time. But then you zero in on Abdul al-Rahman, who he flees from the Abbasids and flees all the way over to the west, all the way to Spain himself, takes the Berbers with him and also some of the Arabs with him, and they they uh, come into into Spain, uh, bringing much of his art and his mosque. The Mes you talk about the Mesquito Mosque, and from that time, then you can see a strong anti-Trinitarian. And you're saying that, that Rahman I is really the one that brings this anti-Trinitarian focus as a ruler, as, as, as a one who's, who is coming with power. Um, I mean, they were anti-Trinitarian before, but he what he really brings is this, this Persian mindset, if you will, or this um, appreciation for Persian art and architecture. He builds this mosquito, uh, the, the mosque, or which was back then a, a church. So he, obviously he promotes this anti-Trinitarianism. But it was already established in Spain, um, at least among the, the ruling class, the, the Umayyad ruling class. All right. And then you jump to the late 8th century to Elephantus, uh, who <laughs> becomes the Archbishop of Toledo, tries to push his anti-Trinitarian views, does not succeed. And then in 839, now we're into the 9th century, of the Rahman he convenes this synod, which has nothing to do with Islam, which you would think it would be if mm -hmm. Islam was dominant at this time. The very next year, the Bishop of Alba of Cordoba writes a, a strong letter of, a, against the anti-Trinitarians and fascinating. And this is what I thought was great. And you picked it up and I'm going to just uh, support this. He uses the, the gospel of Matthew in his defense. Uh, uh, he would have used the Quran is what you're saying. If there had been a Quran at exactly. this time, fascinating. Exactly. Well, hold on a minute. If he is an anti, if he is a Trinitarian, he would then use the Gospel of Matthew. You're saying that no, the yeah. Trinitarians. No, the, the, he, he, yeah, he said in his letter that these anti-Trinitarians use the Gospel of Matthew to justify their gotcha. beliefs. Yeah. yeah, the fact that they use the Gospel of Matthew suggests that there's no Quran at this time. We're talking about 840. We're coming in towards the mid 9th century. Well, 
at, at least no Quran S scripture yeah, in Spain. And certainly not this far west, if there was. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go into 850 when you have the Bishop Eulogius and also Albar condemning Islam categorically. Yeah. But from that time on, Abdul Rahman II then takes over, controls it, and now we see Islam. As we see it in the East, it now is now in the West. Yeah. So you're saying around yeah. 850, mid ninth century is when Islam really came to the West, really came to Spain. Yes. Okay. And um, the, uh, the, the whole idea between the Sunni and the Shiite, that's we haven't even got into. Then, I, again, maybe I wasn't clear enough. So what happens in 12th century is that we get a very strict Sunni form of Islam. It, it's always been Sunni. Um, but then by the 12th century, it becomes uh, very strict and, and, and draconian. Um, yeah. So, okay. So that's that's when also, really, yeah. But yeah. Wouldn't that have also been on both sides, both Spain and the East? You get a much more strict form of Islam coming in. Exactly. Hanafi, um, Hanafi form of Islam. So that, that would fit the prime timeline. So, yeah. so we're now coming in. We're now starting to converge with the Islamic timeline. But that's, we're yeah. talking about 10th, 11th, and 12th century where the convergence <laughs> happens. It's the problem is the 7th, 8th, and 9th century. That's exactly. where it looks like you're bringing an entirely different timeline. And this timeline is based on evidence on the ground. A yeah. much longer, to me, that makes much more sense that this is both political and theological. It did not come in a 22-year period. It certainly didn't even come in a 40-year period, like the standard Islamic narrative would like to uh, tell us. It happened hundreds of years, all the way up until the ninth century. If, uh, if the beginning of the anti-Trinitarian movement really, and you've said this very clearly, really begins with Abdul Malik in the late seventh century, you're talking about another 150 years later before it really moves and gets it has its influence and it takes over in Spain, over in the West, much, much later. Well, the anti-Trinitarian movement is in Spain soon after Abdul Malik, or yeah, but it doesn't evolve into Islam for again for centuries, right? So that that's what takes so long. And it makes sense because yeah, you can't just take a entire country and then like flip it on its head right it always takes time um okay all right this is good this is good thank you now we do need to talk and there has been a viewpoint that this islam that did come to spain was a very benign very benevolent form of islam i remember when yeah. i was down at speaker's corner and i would have debates with Adnan Rashid. I don't know if you know his name, but many of you who are listening, you'll know who Adnan Rashid is. He has a huge following, 400, 500,000 subscribers on YouTube. He uh, uh, is very bellicose uh, in his confrontation of Christianity. And he always uses Andalusian Spain as the, the counter to what Christianity has done in Europe. He says, well, look at what we as Muslims did in Europe. And he always loves to go to Andalusia and say Andalusia was the paradise. This is what true Islam is. You're going to counter that in the next episode. And you're going to show exactly. us another story. <laughs> There's a whole nother mm -hmm. paradigm. I, I know where you're going to go with this because you're not the first to have come up with this. But we do need <laughs> here, before we leave Spain, we need to see what, what Islam was like back there in uh, that part of the world and at that time. Good. Well, until we do, this is Thomas and Jay, over and out. <laughs> <laughs>